All right, good evening, everyone. Um, just do a quick, not started yet, Jesse. Yes, we're kicking off now. Connection issues, no, seven o'clock, we're starting. Um, can I just get a quick, uh, let me know if you can hear me okay, if the volume's all right? Just uh, type something in the chat box, make sure you can hear me. Good audio, all okay. Excellent, thanks, John. Thanks, Patrick. Volume's good. All right, so um, first of all, for those of you that haven't met me, uh, my name is Clint. Um, I'm a, a diagnostics guy and trainer with um, Opus IVS or Autologic, as most of you know. Um, I may have seen you around at a few shows, uh, or I might have um, done a demo for you, or, or you've attended some training. Um, so that's enough about me. First up, I can see everyone. Ah, oh, Chris. G'day, Chris. How you going, mate? Chris is just down the road from me. Like, literally just down the road from me. It's actually quite good. All right. So for those of you that were with us last night, um, I hope you got a little bit out of that. Last night's event was more about um, what Opus is, what the new elite system is, the new tool incoming and where Opus is going uh, in the future. And I think it's quite an exciting time, actually, to be involved with Opus IVS um, just because of the way that our workflow in uh, shops is changing. Um, and I'm seeing that more and more on a day-to-day -day basis um, through both of my roles that I do, one role with Autologic um, doing a support role, and I get to see the problems that roll in with the amount of European cars or even domestic cars that are quite complex. Um, and also, I do some part-time work with the local TAFE. And so I see, talking to the apprentices each day about what rolls into their workshops and some of the, you know, the dramas they might have um, with the complications on the cars. But probably the, the biggest... Um, the biggest issue everyone seems to have, it's not with fixing a problem. We're all really good techs. Um, we've been working for a long time. We've been training and learning as much as we can. But one of the biggest problems is diagnosing the fault and diagnosing the fault profitably. And I think that's the biggest problem. The number of times I have talked to workshops where they're going, we hate doing diagnostics because we can't charge for the hours. And I do feel your pain, I really do, because you can burn up a lot of hours on a complicated fault, and that just doesn't do. Um, if you can't charge hours out, how can you justify paying your technician that extra money that he wants to be a good technician? Um, or if you can't charge the hours out, how can you justify spending money on a, you know, a fantastic diagnostic tool? Well. The idea behind this course, um, I don't know if any of you have actually sat in the course before. Uh, we've run this one uh, once or twice. Um, I think we've done it once webinar and we've done it a couple of times live. Um, Chris, I think you might have attended the one at uh, the TAFE College up here. I think you did actually. Um, no, you definitely did. So uh, tonight's course is the same. Um, same as what we did then. But it's a great idea, if you've seen it before, to revise and just to get your um, diagnostic strategy down pat and just refresh on the way you might be diagnosing some vehicles. Um, you just bear with me as I click around my buttons. Um, you'll notice, if you've never used the webinar before, you'll notice if you look on the right-hand pane, we've got a few uh, little buttons we can click. Um, there's a chat box that's quite handy. If you've got any questions, just chat on that. Um, as I see the, uh, the question, I'll uh, try and answer it straight away. If I can't answer it straight away, I will come back to it. The question will be there for a while. Um, there is a bit of a delay between when you type the question, excuse me, when I receive the question um, and I can reply. So be patient and we'll, um, we'll get back to you. So some of the other things you'll see on the side, um, are, there's a box with some files in it. 
Now, I'm sharing a file at the moment, and you'll see if you click on that, it's a PDF of tonight's presentation. Um, so tonight's presentation, this is part one of two, Getting Grips with Diagnostics 1. Next Wednesday night will be part two. And the reason we've done that is because it's basically uh, over webinar, it's about a two hour course, uh, which is a bit a little bit long to be sitting in front of the computer. So we've just broken up um, 45 minutes an hour tonight, 45 minutes an hour next Wednesday night. Plus you get the presentation, you can download it and then print it off at any point. So that's available for all of you. All right, so getting back to diagnostics. Um, whenever we perform diagnostics, we have to do it quickly and we have to do it accurately. That's the biggest killer uh, for burning up money in any workshop. One is taking too long to perform the diagnosis. If we have to spend all day, you know, that's eight hours we're paying a tech um, to do a diagnosis that we may or may not be able to charge for. Um, and that's a big problem. Really, we should be able to diagnose a problem, um, diagnose, not repair, that is. You want to be able to diagnose a fault within an hour. Um, it doesn't matter if the fault's really, really complex. You need to be able to diagnose it within an hour. Um, now, I know there's some testing that might be a little bit awkward to get meters and tooling and back probes in. They can burn up a bit of time. We might do, need to do some road testing, which can burn up a little bit of time. But on average, we need to look at making a diagnostic decision within that hour. The repair comes after. You know, that's when we order our parts or we get our software or whatever we have to do after. Um, the other big problem with diagnosis is misdiagnosis. And that's where um, somewhere along the way we lose our path. We wander off the, uh, the straight and narrow and we get lost. And we end up um, purchasing or we misdiagnose the fault. And that can be really, really expensive, especially if it's on a, a Volkswagen, BMW. Well, actually, it can be expensive on any European car. And nearly as expensive on some Japanese cars and Australian cars these days. So we really have to be careful, one, about burning hours, two, about misdiagnosis. Um, and the best way to get around both of those faults is to have a diagnostic pathway that we need to follow and stick with that diagnostic pathway. Now, the one I'm going to show you tonight, it's uh, getting groups to diagnostic. It's basically seven steps to diagnostic success. Um, and I quite like that catchy program or catchy slogan um, because there's seven steps in this diagnostic process and they're not difficult to follow. Now, you might find this diagnostic path works for most of your um, problems that you might have when you're diagnosing vehicles. Uh, it might not work for all. You might need to modify it a little bit to fit into your procedures in your workshop. But this is the pathway that um, Opus IVS use. Um, and we, we, we're talking um, 200,000 support cases a year or something like that we, we look after, I think was the term last night. Um, Pat, if you can remember what how many diagnostic cases we do in a year. Uh, the process works and it works fairly well. So our master techs have to be able to help you guys with the diagnosis and it's got to be done really, really quick in a, in a nice, efficient manner. All right, so I'm just going to click. We're going to get through these slides and we're going to get on with it. Okay, so the seven diagnostic challenges. Vehicles have become extremely complex in the last 20 years and they will continue at an exponential rate. And I think you can all agree that they are getting very complex. Um, complicated, complex, uh, many, many systems in them. Um, now we know that the biggest challenge in a workshop today is that techs feel overburdened with advanced legal systems, especially the European ones. Um, my background is a GM diagnostic tech. Uh, I worked side by side with the, the uh, support or field service engineers. So I got to see the best and worst of Holden. And I must say that working for Holden was fantastic because I got to see and got to repair and got to diagnose faults in every model car there was. And because it's a Holden, I actually, um, there were faults in every model and faults in every system. So we can bag them as much as we want, but they've probably made me a very, very good technician or a great diagnostician. Um, and I can be brutally honest and, and say that. Um, 
but I know that technicians do feel really overwhelmed with some of the problems and some of the European systems out there that even I've had to deal with, I have to throw my hands up in the air and go, what were they thinking? Okay, uh, the th third diagnostic challenge, technicians and business owners feel anxious about taking on a job for the fear of not being able to fix the job, not being able to diagnose. Yeah, Pat, it was a huge amount. It was an amazing amount of support cases. Um, I know uh, I did, um, so I was working, I was teaching students today, but during my lunch hour and my morning tea break, um, I took three or four cases on as well because our guys were um, under the pump today and it's only Thursday. I mean, our, our support technicians that um, help workshops out, generally Mondays and Tuesdays are the busiest days because that's when all the Land Rovers and Volkswagens break down on the weekend. Um, Fridays are really bad days for our support techs because everyone wants their BMWs or their um, Jags ready for the road trip on the weekend and they're still broken down from the previous week. So we do a lot of support. Um, so technicians and business owners do feel a bit anxious about taking on a job, um, especially because it could be over their head, it could be outside their, their field of knowledge or they might just not have the tooling to deal with that particular vehicle. Um, so I, I do tend to understand that. Um, number four, technicians are dealing with multiple different network systems that are far more challenging than 10 years ago. And by network systems, we're talking about uh, the computer systems in the cars that are linked together over the network. And they really are complicated. Um, I had a, one of the support cases I did today was on a Captiva of all things, a 2012 Captiva. And it had a really strange communication issue going on from the ABS module that was actually pulling the network down and stopping the engine from running properly. And it was simply a communication network, a high speed problem. Um, we sorted that and straight away the engine ran well. Now really the engine should run fine by itself, even if the network crashes. But that's a Captiva, you know, and they're a fairly simple car. Um, so you can only imagine what a new 7 Series uh, BMW or a, uh, an Audi Q8 system or, you know, a Lamborghini has got in it. So it can be very complicated. Um, okay, number five, to avoid swap diagnostics to fix the vehicle. That's a diagnostic challenge. Um, it's one of my pet hates. I don't like replacing parts to see if it fixes the car because that's really not diagnostics. Um, that's kind of cheating in a way, um, but it's also an expensive way. If you're working in a dealership and you've got 10 cars that are identical side by side and it's very quick to pull an EGR off one car and put it on the other to see if it fixes, if it's quick, that's probably an okay thing to do. But if you're in a small workshop like Paddy's out in the middle of Dubbo and a, um, a Q8 rolls into town and he's got to diagnose it, you can't just walk to the car park and swap parts over. It's just really hard. Um, or even Chris down in your workshop, you know, uh, although you did tell me a dozen Ferraris rolled past your shop the other day. So that's quite interesting. So we can't swap parts. It's not easy for us out being outside of a dealership. Um, another diagnostic challenge, we have to ensure that the diagnostic work is efficient and profitable. That's one of the things we talked about at the start. So yeah, it's got to be profitable. Um, my big belief is that I charge for diagnostics whenever I'm doing a job. Um, my time is valuable. Someone's paying me to diagnose this car, the customer should be paying them. It's as simple as that. Um, and I value my time. So my time, for the last 20 something years, I've spent learning about vehicles and learning how to fix them. I should be able to charge that dollar value onto the customer. Um, they need to pay for my knowledge, not just the use of the tools and when I pick up spanners. Um, and the last diagnostic, diagnostic challenge is to achieve customer satisfaction and confidence in the diagnostic repair. So you want that customer to leave going, yes, that job is 100% fixed. They're confident in the job you've done because then they'll come back. Um, you know, and it's not that we just want them to come back, but we want them to tell their friends to come back as well and tell them what a, um, you know, a fantastic job we did on their vehicle. 
So they're the seven diagnostic challenges we face. And you probably, you know, you can pick and choose between them. You might be able to add one or two, but they're the main ones we see. Okay, so what we're going to look at over the next, uh, over tonight and next Wednesday, um, we're going to look at evolving technology and communication networks that are in the vehicle. Uh, we're going to look at how to gather information and interrogate our customers. Um, we're going to talk about gathering vehicle data and performing uh, quick tests or taking fault code reports. Um, we're going to look at interpreting fault code report. We're also going to look at live data to verify that the fault is there and verify the faults exist. And that's quite a big one. We need to verify that it's a, it is a fault we're chasing. Um, we also need to go, know where to go to get our technical resources um, or what reference material we need to use. One of the biggest things is knowing when to ask for help. Um, and I see this quite a lot. Do we absolutely bury ourselves, you know, when do we ask for a hand out of the hole and we're, we're digging this hole? Do we ask when it's too deep for the person to reach down and, and help us? Or do we ask when we're knee deep into it and go, eh, you know what, now would be a good time to get a bit of help on the side here. And um, I'm a technician and I've been a tech for years. Um, I don't sit behind a desk. I get out and I do jobs, um, not just support jobs with Opus, but I do get out and repair vehicles. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hands deep at the TAFE college I work at as well. Um, so, you know, I, I know the challenges I, and I know how hard it can be, you know. So I'm sort of the first person to put my hand up knowing that if a job is too hard and I'm a proud technician and I hate to let people know that I can't fix something, but there is a time and place where I have to put up my hand and go, really, I'm just burying myself here. Um, and the last thing we're going to talk about is after the repair has been done, completing some sort of initialization process. And initializing is basically when we've replaced a module or put a component in and we have to teach the car that this new component's there or teach the component um, that it now belongs to a part of the system. All right. So the evolving electrical architecture. I'm just going to take a quick drink here. Feel free to um, pop your questions in the chat box. All right, the evolving electrical architecture. 30 years ago, vehicle wiring harnesses were made generally of copper, similar to what they are now. Um, so we're talking back in the uh, early 90s. Um, as greater consumer demand for convenience or ride safety and performance, infotainment and braking systems, uh, not to mention government legislation, Driving a, clean, driving a cleaner and more efficient vehicle um, has increased the size of the harnesses that we actually see in our car. So just a quick look at that graph at the bottom, and it gives us a bit of an idea. Um, I'm not sure what the scaling is in, but it talks about, uh, you know, quantities of low wattage uh, or low voltage wiring, uh, quantities of connectors and uh, cut pieces of wire. So that's mid-90s, and we've all worked on mid-90s cars. They weren't too bad. All right, this is what we're looking at now in the 2020s. Um, because of the multiple network systems we're using now, a lot of the systems are still copper, except we are um, adding a lot more um, fiber optic technology in vehicles these days. Um, if we look at the bar graph down on the right, you can actually see a massive increase. Um, the figures don't matter so much, but if we look at the um, the symbols and the size of those symbols on the graph, it's a pretty clear indication of what the cars are, um, how the cars are being constructed these days. And they are quite complex. For anyone that's pulled up a carpet and had to go digging into wiring harness on a new car, um, it's it's getting quite complicated. You know, there's, there's a lot of wires in there to choose from when you're looking for a short or a, an open. Now, for those of you that um, aren't familiar with vehicle networks, a network is designed to allow communication between different ECUs on that network. So if you were to think at home, everyone I think has uh, some sort of um, a wireless modem, you've got one at work, and they all plugged in by a blue cable. But when we start putting multiple computers in via those blue cables, it's just what we call a network. So 
vehicles use the same sort of network, multiple computers across the car all talking to each other over a network. Now, those computers might use some high-speed networks to talk between each other. They might use low-speed networks. Um, they might use a most network. And a most network is a very, very high-speed one. Um, and if anyone's uh, come across those, they can be in either a two-wire copper for the cheaper ones, um, or again, optical fibre for the more expensive and better quality ones. And a lot of time we find most networks in media systems. And that's what most stands for, really, media-oriented system transport. And it's basically for video, um, you know, massive amounts of communication, music. Um, you know, our passengers in the back seat want to listen to high-quality music and uh, watch um, movies while you're driving somewhere. Well, so there's no interruption between where the DVD player or the MP3 player might be to the screens, the transmission is sent over most. And the reason we use most is because it's such a broad spectrum data transfer method. Um, we can transfer huge packets of data through those optical fibre cables. Um, it's a complicated system. It's a technology. Um, they have been out for a while in some cars with varying degrees of reliability. But we sort of need to know, um, we don't need to know the ins and outs of each network, we just need to know they exist and why these cars get so complicated. Um, now, that's one system. Another system we, we, we throw around a lot is CAN system, controller area network. Now, CAN systems have been around for a very long time and for good reason, they're very reliable. They work really, really well. Um, we use low speed networks. Um, we use communication via serial networks. We use, um, there's older protocols out there now, UART, um, J-Line, uh, Serial 2, um, J18 or 1850VPW. There's all these different types of serial communication that are across all different vehicles. Um, and we sort of, we really need to know they exist because they can influence the way we diagnose. Um, what most good quality cars use is a gateway module. And a gateway module or a multiplexing module is a common module where all those networks come in together and meet. And that module is responsible for translating the messages from a high speed to a low speed or being the gateway from our um, scan tool where we plug our scan tool in. And the scan tool will talk to the gateway and the gateway then sends the message off to uh, each different network wherever we might be. So the cars are very, very complex, and the tooling we use to talk to the cars must also be very, very complex. Uh, and what complex systems are we dealing with today? Um, we sort of need to know when we do any diagnosis, we need to know what systems are on that car, um, but we really need to know electrical systems. And we really concentrate around electrical diagnostics because that's where the majority of our problems are and electrical. Um, we can all tell when a con rod's hanging out the side of the motor because the engine's not running very well, it's making this loud noise and there's oil dripping on the ground. You know, we just can have a bit of a look, oh yeah, we can see that. Um, or diagnosing noisy brakes, again, that's not too bad. Diagnosing shocks worn out or bushes or vibrations can be a little bit harder. Um, you know, diagnosing problems in a transmission, well, does it shift into gear? Can I feel it shift? Um, is this other crunching? Is it synchros? Um, again, getting a little bit more complex. Uh, automatic transmission diagnostics. Mechanically, again, not so different from the old systems, but electrically, using the mechatronic side, they are getting a little bit harder. And then diagnosing any fault in an engine management system, a body management system, diagnosing SRS systems these days can be difficult. So um, you do need to know your electrical systems on the car, and you need to know your way around them. Okay, so this is an older school um, communication network. So this is KWP2000. This is an older system. So this is very, this is early Toyotas. Um, now, generally single wire copper line. Um, later systems are definitely on some of the 06 to 28 models. We're using two wires, but that was only if one wire um, broke down, they couldn't communicate on it. It was. Um, a Japanese answer to um, Bosch's CAN system. Not very fast, um, fairly reliable, but to talk to a, a, a KWP2000, um, generally we needed a 
tool that was designed by the manufacturer. So to talk to an early Toyota, it's best if you have the early Toyota scan tool. Um, a lot of the time we had some issues with some, you know, generic scan tools talking to those cars. It was generally hit and miss at the best of times. So the next communication network we see, LIN. LIN is quite common these days. It's a very uh, robust system. It's a very simple system. It's a cheap system. It's cheap to manufacture and cheap to implement because it cuts down on the number of wires that we use in a vehicle. Um, so LIN network is what we, it's a low speed network. So if we look at the, um, the board rate there and board rate refers to the speed or the data transfer rate. The higher the board rate, the better the network um, and the more expensive it is for a manufacturer to use. So LIN is a serial protocol. It's a single wire, low speed network. And it's used on peripheral ECUs. So if we have a look there, um, the door modules, mirrors, door locks, windows, stuff that doesn't, it's not overly important. Convenience systems, uh, climate control systems, um, cruise control, turn signals, seat position, um, rain sensors, sunroof. Again, they're all convenient systems. They're systems that don't matter if we're trying to undo the window and adjust the climate control at the same time. It doesn't matter if one is a little bit slower than the other because it's convenience. The customers generally don't worry too much about that. And those systems aren't that important. Um, the reason we use it, a, a LIN bus system has, it's basically a master slave system. So if we look in the center and we look at, at our, our um, sorry, a door lock module, the master door lock module would probably be in the driver's side. Um, and when we press door, all doors unlock, or we try to unlock or operate a, uh, a window on the left hand rear, the signal comes from our switch to the LIN master. The LIN master sends a signal to the slave, whichever slave we've actually commanded, over one wire. Now, traditionally, if we wanted to wind a window up and down, an electric window up and down, we need two wires going from the switch and a fairly complicated rocker switch so we can swap the, the current flow through the switch, and then two heavy wires from that switch down to each power window. Um, so in total, for the four windows, there's eight heavy-duty wires. You know, that system worked, but it relied on a mechanical switch that uh, needs a lot of current flow through it. Using a LIN network, we really only need one wire from our, um, uh, our window switch to our LIN master, and then one wire from our LIN master to each um, individual module. And that wire can be very, very thin, right? Only a very, very small wire because it's just signaling. All it's doing is telling that window to go up or to go down. Um, the next one, CAN, Control Area Network. Um, again, you're probably all familiar with uh, CAN systems, um, but Control Area Network was de designed by uh, Robert Bosch back in uh, 1994, if I remember right. He came out with it. Um, and it's basically a very robust high-speed network. Now, if you have a look at it, um, 500 kilobytes a second, that's the board rate. So it's basically CAN is real-time information and it's high speed. Um, CAN messages are broadcast across two wires in the system. And if you look at the diagram there, you can see the two wires. There's CAN high and CAN low. Now the CAN high doesn't mean that that wire operates at a different speed. It basically means that the way that wire or the way the message is transmitted, it's a voltage signal from say two and a half volts. It's held at two and a half volts um, static and it's pulled up to three and a half volts. Um, two and a half, three and a half. Sorry, two and a half to three volts, it's pulled up half a volt. So we call that high because the voltage is held low and then pulled high in a switch. So off, on, off, on. Can low works the opposite way. It's basically inverted, still high speed wire, but it's held at two and a half volts and then it's pulled down to two volts. So it's off. Um, we're talking binary code here. Um, off would be two and a half volts, on would be two volts. So while my high speed's going up like this in a square wave, my low speed is going like this, can low is going like this. And the reason we do that is because what we're actually looking for is the difference in voltage between the high and the low. And if we're going from two and a half to three and two and a half to two, the differential voltage is one volt. And the reason Robert Bosch did that is because we can have big resistance on those wires, we can have some issues, poor contacts, 
and that will change the voltage on both wires. So the voltage might pick up, the voltage might pick down, but the difference between can high and can low remains the same all the time, one volt differential. And that's where our signal is. That's where our on, off, on, off. And it doesn't matter if it's up here or down here. So CAN's very, very robust. It's very high speed. So it's perfect for um, real-time systems. Live data systems is perfect for powertrain. It's perfect for ABS. It's perfect for stability, traction control, um, our uh, safety systems, our, our driver uh, assist systems. So CAN networks are very reliable, but they do have issues. Um, but again, I really um, can't stress enough how important it is to understand the basics of these systems so that when we go to diagnose a CAN fault, we can do it very, very quickly and easily. Now, the other node under here is a mid-speed CAN network, and that's the other um, one we see. It's a 250 kilobyte board rate. Um, and we might see that in some vehicles for um, systems that maybe aren't quite as important as uh, ABS or engine management systems, um, but they might be important in other ways. So we might see that as a, um, a media system on some Opal vehicles, uh, some European stuff. So don't be afraid if you come across a mid-speed network in the vehicle. It does the same thing. Um, Flexray is a new system that's out now. Uh, BMWs are using Flexray. Uh, some Audi Volkswagens are using it. Volvos are using Flexray. Flexray, again, is a two-wire system. Again, we see the two wires twisted together in that pair in the wiring harness. Um, the reason we're using it is because the data transfer is much, much faster between modules. They can communicate very quickly. But the bandwidth on that module is really wide. So there's still serial data, but we can pack more information into that same those same two wires in the same time. You know, we can send much, much more information on those wires. So um, you can see there it's, it's 10 megabyte um, board rate, which is the other one's 500 kilobyte. Uh, 10 meg is, uh, I think that's 100, is that 100 times bigger, 100, no, 10,000, 10,000, I, I can't remember. It's 7.30 on a uh, Wednesday night and my brain's not working. Trust me, it's a lot. It's huge. So BMWs and Volvos and Volksies and Audis, they're using it because it's a very, very high transfer rate and those systems are complicated but it's expensive. So don't expect to see it on a Hyundai soon. Uh, you won't see it on a GM vehicle because GM doesn't exist anymore. So I can't bag them very much. Uh, very expensive, so we're only sort of seeing it on upper European brands. Okay, uh, here's our most network, media-oriented system transport. So this one I was talking about. Uh, it is a very, very high-speed media network, and that's what it's used for. It is overkill. If we were to use it on an um, uh, engine management system, absolute overkill, very, very expensive. Uh, it's um, optical fibre. So um, everyone's experienced issues with NBN, I gather. Um, we still haven't got reliable NBN here because someone, I think, skimps the optical fibre cable. So we're back to the old copper wire because it works even if it's bent in half. And this is a problem we, we actually find with most. Generally, most is very, very reliable. It does not break down. It's optical fibre. It uses light. It can't break down, right? Age will not weary them. But accidents will. If that car has been an accident and it's had a sill panel crushed, and guess what? The uh, most... Um, optical fibres run down that sill panel with the other harness. If that though, um, fibre gets kinked in any way, the light will escape at that kink, so our most system will stop working. So we need to be able to diagnose systems in those convenience vehicles. Um, and they can be a little bit tricky, and there's some really cool tools out there we can use. Um, I, I came across um, the system, one of our um, tech support guys is doing some training, Rich, and he actually showed me on my car that runs the most system through the, the media. And he showed me how to diagnose it with the Drive Pro tool. And I was absolutely blown away that we could look at the optical network and the electrical network um, at the same time. And the tool would just give us a, yep, this one's working, or no, it's not working. Um, and it would tell us, you know, so if the optical network was not working, it was basically a break or a crack or a kink in the optical network somewhere. 
um, or if the electrical network was not working, it's basically a power supply or a ground problem between one of the modules. And I thought that was really, really cool. So we can see here that it uses a ring topology. So we need a, a signal going into this unit and then out of that unit, into this unit, then out of that unit. So there'll be one more, one cable, fibre cable going in, one coming out. Now, as with any ring main, if I break that wire, if I break that um, optical fibre, everything from you know here down stops working, right? So we have to be able to backtrack to actually do our diagnostics on it. This is why it's really important to understand the system you're going to work on before you do the diagnosis. Um, most networks up to 64 modules, that's 64 high speed, high bandwidth computers uh, that we can bolt on one of these networks. Um, and this bottom one, nearly all vehicle manufacturers use some form of most. Um, GM vehicles, uh, and especially the Opal ones, so the latest Commodore is using most, but it's using a wire most, a copper wire most network, because it's a bit cheaper. Okay, uh, one of the last protocols we sort of look at is DOIP, which is Diagnostics Over Internet Protocol, uh, DOIP. And there's the SAE um, standard for DOIP right there. Um, again, DOIP is, it's again, a, a more advanced flex ray or Ethernet system, Ethernet uh, connection. Um, huge file transfer rates. Very, very efficient, very time saving. Um, a lot of our vehicles these days, we need what we call a DOIP cable attached. We can't talk to the car unless we have a specific DOIP cable. And with our tools, it's still got the 16-pin uh, OBD2 connector. It looks exactly the same, except there's an additional wire. Now, for anyone that's seen our tools, um, I don't have one here. It's out on loan. The cable itself, if I just hold the, you know, my Sharpie pen up to the camera, the cable itself is very, very thick. Um, when we use DOIP, there is an additional Ethernet cable that runs beside it out of the diagnostic connector. So we need that additional cabling to transfer data or communicate between the scan tool and the car because of the huge amounts of data transfer that we're doing. Um, and that could simply be just changing the um, e-logbook on a BMW, we need DOIP, um, before we even get to programming a car and, and putting um, new engine management or calibration files in the vehicle. So DOIP is here, it's across a lot of brands now, definitely 17, 18, 19, 20 year model vehicles in the European segment. Um, haven't seen it in Japanese or Korean vehicles yet, um, but I'm sure it'll come, it'll flow down to those as the price gets a little bit cheaper. Be aware that it's out there. All right, here we go, the seven step diagnostic strategy. Now that we've covered some uh, nice, highly complex diagnostic uh, protocols. Um, these are the steps we use. So this is what I use whenever I do diagnostics and um, believe it or not, it's the same strategy that Opus used. So I was pretty excited when I started working for AutoLogic and they had the same views that I did. But when you think about it, there really is, there's many ways to do stuff, um, but there's one really good refined way. This is our way, you might have your own. Um, if you take one of these away and add it to your own um, diagnostic process, that's fantastic. Mm. I apologise, I've been talking all day and I'm still well into the night. I need to keep the fluids up. Okay, so the seven steps we're going to look at. Um, step one, verify the fault. Make sure it's a fault, not a feature, all right? As with most uh, GM vehicles I've ever worked on, I have to be 100% sure that it is a fault and it's not just a feature of Holden that the car shudders and shakes and pulls off the road or uh, when you turn the ignition on, the radio dies and then it comes back to life later. That's a feature on some cars. Okay, uh, the second step, once we've verified the fault, we need to collect the facts. And the facts will come in any form. Facts might come from a road test. Facts might come from talking to the customer. The facts might come from doing a quick test using the scan tool, pulling DTCs. They're facts. That's the stuff that we, we actually know about. Uh, the next step is interpreting the fault report. Now, that's really big for us because when we generate a quick test and generate a fault report, that can tell us a lot about the car. And a, a fault report, which I'll show you shortly, 
has a lot of information on it. it. It gives us information on the control modules. It tells us which ones you've reported the fault. It gives us priority coding of the fault, which ones log the fault or which one we should diagnose first. Um, it also gives us a little bit of information. In some instances, it'll give us some um, uh, freeze frame data attached to it so we can see what was going on when the car faulted. Uh, the next thing is doing some testing and evaluation, and that's we're looking at a particular fault code, and we go, right, I'm going to do a quick test and see if uh, the test corresponds with the fault code. And then I'll, I'll make some sort of evaluation from that point. Uh, then we, that might put us down the pathway of component wiring a module test. So if I go back to the EGR, what I'm going to do is the fault report might be an EGR. It's, it's logging a position sensor code on an EGR. Um, the test and evaluation might be me using the scan tool to drive the EGR open and close. So the scan tool, I'm commanding it open to 80% and then I'm looking at the position. Is it open 80%? That's my test and evaluation in that instance. Um, and this is where I might go, okay, so I've commanded the EGR valve 80% open. The EGR is only moving to 20% and it's not going past that as I try and drive with the scan tool. I go, aha, so there's definitely a fault there. Uh, it is a, it's a fact, I've verified it. Um, now I need some information on that EGR system. So um, this, is where, this is where I like to learn a little bit about the system quickly or I like to understand the system before I throw parts at this particular car. Um, like I said, some workshops will grab an EGR and I'll have an EGR sitting on the shelf and I'll bolt it on because it's nice and quick. And especially when we're talking, um, you know, Mitsubishi Tritons where EGRs are a common problem, you know, where they do stop working. It's not that they're carboned up, they just stop working. So it might pay to undo the four bolts, throw the EGR on and see if it fixes it. Um, but a lot of us don't have the luxury of having the parts sitting there or having another car sitting there because what can go wrong and it's happened to me many times where you know i've had 10 cars in with the same problem same problem same problem you know um throw an abs module throw an abs module throw an abs module throw an abs module this car didn't fix it and that was two thousand dollars and oh god you know so i fell into that trap of um you know I, it was the same fault over and over and over but i i missed the test or i missed the proving part of it so from that point on, I'm going, right, I'm not going to throw um, parts at this car because, you know, 80% of the time it works, that 20% of the time it doesn't work. I've just blown all my profit in the uh, last 10 jobs um, because at the end of the day, you can't charge the customer for a part that didn't fix the car. It's not their fault. Um, morally, it's not their fault. So um, that part, you might have had to buy it in. You've got to take it back off. Um, you know, uh, although I've known some service advisors that can sweet talk the customer into paying for it, I don't know how they make them believe that it's a fault. But the right thing is to do is to not charge the customer. But the, the really right thing to do is to not make the mistake and put a part on there that the car doesn't need. Um, so that's where we need our technical resources. Um, technical resources, circuit diagrams, uh, OEM information, um, uh, your, your auto data, your uh, Haynes guided data, um, Technical resource might even be pressing the help button on our scan tool, the support button that puts you in touch with a, um, you know, the master tech in that field. And I've been using that one myself more and more lately, just because it's so easy. Um, once we've looked at the technical resource, oh, and technical resource might be TSBs, technical service bulletins, or common faults that occur with the car. Um, and they're all bits of information we can use that will help us diagnose that that vehicle faster before we have to spend money on. It. Uh, number six would be we've got the technical information, we then need to test the component, test the wiring or test the control module before we replace it. Um, and that's quite important. And that we could have been led there from step five, the technical resource. Um, the last step in the diagnostic strategy is to do the repair. So Diagnosis, although we like to cut off diagnosis at point six and go, yep, that's the point you ring the customer. Um, the job's not finished until it's finished, and that means proving the repair. You know, we put the EGR on, let's prove it's fixed. That's the end of your process, okay? Um, then we might need to do some adaptions to teach the ECM the new end stops on the EGR valve. Um, go for a road test and confirm that the engine light doesn't come back on again. 
And you've just got to be really careful when I quickly talk about road tests that you put the vehicle through the conditions that are required to set that DTC. Um, too many times I've seen technicians, again, I'll bring the EGR up, they throw an EGR on the car, cycle the key, clear the code, drive around the block, and the engine light's not on. Beauty, park it out the front, customer comes pick up the car. Customer rings us an hour later and said the engine light's back on, same fault's occurring. Because the technician didn't look at the reason um, that that code is set or the conditions for setting that code. Um, and those conditions might be that it doesn't run the DTC until the second ignition cycle, or the car needs to be operating for 20 minutes, not 10. So unless the, the technician actually road tests the vehicle properly and puts it through the conditions for setting that code, they're not finishing the, that process, they're not finishing that job. And that's, that's then a comeback, the customer's unhappy and we've missed not diagnosed the vehicle. So I'm really, really adamant about that. Okay, so step one, nice and quickly, what is the fault? Where is the fault? When does the fault occur? Um, so they're questions we're gonna ask the customer. You've all got copies of this. You've probably got your own worksheets you, you work with and, uh, you know, give to the customer. Get them to, to fill the checkbox, tick it off. Um, you know, as we're road testing with them, we let the customer drive. Show me. You drive. You show me where the car faults because I drive differently to the customer. So some of the questions we ask are, uh, has there been any repair work done on the vehicle? Um, we need to know that. We need to know if the car's been to three different workshops before it comes to you. Customers won't tell you that. You know, we know. Um, then, yeah, you've all been there. Uh, customers have been to three different workshops before it gets to you, but they don't tell you that it's had an ECU, it's had a wiring harness, it's had this, it's had that. But what they don't tell you is that the car was in a crash before it went anywhere, you know, and it's got a pinched harness. You need as much information as you can. How often does the problem occur is a great question. How long after the vehicle started does the problem occur? Does the problem occur when the vehicle's cornering or going over bumps? That's fantastic because a poor connection, as we go over a bump, the connection will move and it might flame out. Does weather have any effect when the fault occurs? Uh, if you drive a Ford Falcon, weather has a big effect on whether those cars start or not um, and whether the ECMs fill up with water from the windscreen. So weather is a big one. My ute runs great whenever it's sunny. Whenever it rains, I have to dry the ECM to get this. Actually, I'll just kick the VCM now to get it to run. Uh, does the car have to be idling, driving in reverse, moving forward in gear? Get as much information about driving characteristics. Is there anything at all, no matter how crazy it sounds, that the customer associates with a problem? I have solved problems on cars where the customer is very reluctant to tell me about the strange noises the car makes because they don't want to repeat the noises. Um, and at the end of the day, I went for a drive with a customer and they, they couldn't explain to me that the car sounded like it was farting. They didn't want to say that. But it turns out it was the ABS operating and they felt the vibration up through the floor. Um, customer, for some reason, didn't want to talk about that to me, but they were happy to take me for a drive and show me. So we need to get as much information as we can. That will help us verify the complaint. Um, this is a great, this is really interesting, collecting the facts. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. These are facts. So we determine our facts uh, with all support cases by running a quick test. And a quick test is exactly that. Um, for those of you that have the auto logic, uh, and I'm not sure who's got one, here, I know some of you have used them. Um, the quick test on Volkswagens is a not so quick test because there's a lot of modules it's got to interrogate. Um, on a BMW, a quick test is a quick test. It takes about 30 seconds and it gives us lots of information. Um, but it gives us some information from every module. Now, this is really important for us because, you know, you might have an engine light on and you do a DTC search and you give us the, um, the DTC that's only associated with the engine. But what we need to see as diagnosticians, um, and this might be the customer, the customer comes in and they've been to super cheap, super cheap have plugged their little $200 scan tool in, and it's got this fault code, it's got this generic powertrain fault code, and they want you to diagnose it. What they don't know is that fault code has been set because there's a problem in the transmission control module, or there's a problem in the ABS control module that the $200 scan tool just will not pick up. 
This is why we need to see a complete fault report. So before I mentioned I did a support case today with a, um, uh, a Captiva, the Captiva was running really bad, engine-wise ran terrible, not one DTC in the engine. And the customer actually said, we've checked it and checked it, there are no faults in the engine computer, and there weren't. The fault was in the ABS control module, and that was bringing down the uh, running capability of the engine, which is very, very strange, but that's what happened. And the only way we could pick that up was by running a complete module check across every module in that car. And once I saw that fault in the ABS, we went in and had a quick look, and we could see that it was a weird communication fault. Um, we fixed that fault, cleared the code, instantly the car ran really well. So these are some of the things we need to look for, the whole vehicle. All right, uh, next, interpreting a fault report. So we've done a fault report. Now on the screen, the information you can see on the right is one of our fault reports. This is a quick test report. So this is what you'll see. Our tool generates one of those reports. You can email it to yourself. You can email it to the customer. When you log a, a support case with us, this automatically comes to us. And there is a lot of information there. And you can see it's not just DTCs. So I know that most of you will use um, some sort of scan tool if you're not using one of ours. And those, those scan tools will just give you a DTC list and a little descriptor. Um, the fault report generated by the AutoLogic uses OEM um, licensing and OEM level um, reporting. So when we actually have a look here, it reports in exactly the same way that an OEM tool would but it gives us a hell of a lot more information. Um, it gives us modules with faults, modules that don't have faults, uh, modules that have got faults in them, but they're now history, uh, that haven't occurred in a very long time, modules that have current faults, uh, modules that have got intermittent faults, so they might occur every now and again. But it also, very, very importantly, gives us information on modules that are good and operating well, or that might not be fitted to the vehicle. Um, and I've come across it where people have gone trying to diagnose a problem in a particular control module because the scan tool won't communicate with it. But what they didn't know is that module is not fitted to that series of vehicle. The great thing about these reports, it tells us um, whether it's supposed to have it fitted or not. Uh, so we have a quick look at this one. Stored DTC but not current. Stored, it is current and it illuminates the mill. A malfunction indicator lamp. Um, some DTCs don't turn an engine light on. They, they're a, a type B TDC rather than a type A, and they'll log a fault report, they'll be current, but they're not associated with emission control. Now, that's something we have to know about. An engine light generally only comes on if the fault will upset the emission control system or upset the emissions coming out the back. And that's what OBD2 communication is all about. Um, and that's when the fault light comes on. It tells us there's a problem with the emission system. It might be in the engine management, it might be in the transmission, but that little engine, the check engine light, is generally a uh, emissions fault. But there might be faults stored that aren't associated with it. So that's stuff we need to keep in the back of our mind. And the great thing is these fault code reports that are generated by a quick test will give us that information. Um, very, very interesting. Each manufacturer has their own way of reporting DTCs. And I find it very hard, coming from a, uh, a Japanese, Asian background, GM background to European, I find the language very, very difficult. And the way they pronounce things, now, if it's German, it's obviously very, very good and it's very, very correct because the Germans do everything straight down the line. When they do it, they do it right. Um, but they also uh, call things a little bit different to what we would expect. So when we have a Mercedes and we get a quick test report with Mercedes and the DTC comes up with a vent on it, in Mercedes language that means it's sporadic or an intermittent fault. Um, and that's quite hard because if we get DTC, P0, whatever, event, it's intermittent, it's not there all the time, it comes and it goes. We need to know that when we diagnose. Um, a current fault means it's a hard fault, it can't be cleared on Mercedes. The fault must be rectified before you can clear it. Now, I know a lot of people like to just clear codes and then get the car back on the road, just clear it, send it back with the customer, let them deal with it, but it's not the right way to diagnose. Current is a hard fault. It's there now. It's occurring. Stored faults, they will clear. Um, but with Mercedes-Benz, they uh, 
come back, right? We'll clear it. It'll go no more faults. You might do two drive circles and it pops back up. It's still there. It hasn't actually gone. But that's what we call a history DTC. Um, the computer is still looking for it. With Mercedes, because it's occurred once, it still looks for that fault in the future just to make sure it hasn't popped its head up. Um, that's with Mercedes. When we move on to Volkswagen Audi Group vehicles, bags, um, they record static and sporadic, sporadic faults. Static and sporadic. Um, actually, what's that doing there? It shouldn't be on that page. Uh, sorry, let's go on to BMW. BMW have three different types of faults when we see DTCs. Uh, permanent faults, it comes up as a fault present or a current fault or a fault not present as a history fault. So they've got the same meanings, um, but they're pronounced a little bit differently and they're worded a little bit differently. So that can pose a bit of a problem for us when we're diagnosing again, when we're collecting the facts. So we need to know what BMW means versus what Mercedes mean when they talk. Why vags there? Um, so this particular one here, so they're a BMW one, so they're a little bit different. Um, if we look at this particular fault report, now I believe this is a BMW one. A permanent fault is related with the life to, with a lifetime component, or it's an internal fault. So with BMW. Um, that could be a DPF. So what we're looking at here, if it comes up with DTC, whatever, permanent fault, and you can see it on the quick test report, um, most likely condition related, um, a control unit internal fault, catalytic converter aging fault, um, something that, that's gonna happen over a period of time with the vehicle. And that's when we'll see a permanent fault. And basically what it might be telling us is the cat converter is no longer efficient. So it might log a, an efficiency, a DTC P0430 efficiency code, but it'll call it a permanent fault, which means it's an aging fault. It's occurring as the vehicle, as that component wears out over its life. Um, fault present, which means uh, it's a current fault. So when we see um, fault present on a BMW, uh, the moment the tool was scanning of the car, the feedback voltage from the sensor was too high as a short to voltage or too low as in a short to ground. That's called a current fault or um, BMW speak fault currently present. A little bit different, but to us, that's a current stored fault. It's happening now as we're scanning it. They're the ones you want because they're the ones you can find straight away. The intermittent ones or the sporadics are uh, which is this one, fault not present or history, which is a sporadic VAG fault. Um, it's logged, but it was okay when it was scanned. It can turn into a fault present when the car's running. It's an intermittent fault, right? It knows it's there, but it's not currently there. The idea of these and the way they're describing it, it helps us diagnose it. So if I was to look at that fault currently not present, you know what, I need to go and drive this car. I need to put it through the conditions that set the code. Um, just so I can see what's actually going on, to see whether it is going over a bump, to see whether it is when I slam the door. And it might help. I might be watching this particular DTC on the screen while we're doing the scan, I'll open and close the door and slam it a few times because it might be the shaking of the cup and it might change from uh, fault present to fault current. Uh, so this particular one we can see DSC unit pressure sensor plausibility fault currently not present. It's an intermittent one. And the great thing about this, when it registered the fault, we have some information. Uh, time since the uh, fault occurred, 21 hours. That information is really, really good for us because we can actually look back and go, yeah, it occurred at this point, what was the car doing? And we can ask the customer. All right, so once we've interpreted our data, so what I've just gone over here are the AutoLogic um, quick test reports. And that's looking at our, um, I'll just quickly go back. This is our quick test. This is part of our collecting the facts, right? So we need to know exactly what's going on. And again, this doesn't take very long. Once you're conditioned to have a process when you do your diagnostics, reading a fault report and actually understanding it doesn't take you very long at all, um, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and you'll be through it. Um, and there your facts collected. The next part of the process, if you remember, was uh, collecting our resources. So we might have a DTC, 
we can see it's a current DTC. We need some information on what that DTC actually means or that fault code means or even what those symptoms mean. So we sort of need to go to some sort of technical resource. Um, now, there's a few different technical resources. The one we offer is the AutoLogic Guided Data. This was the one that comes in our tools. Um, what I like about this, it's got TSBs uh, in recalls for that particular model. Now, the TSB might relate, the technical service bulletin might relate to your DTC or your um, symptom-based diagnostic or the symptoms the car is exhibiting. Um, and TSBs are great because they're problems that have occurred in a majority of cars. The manufacturer has issued technical service bulletin because it saves us time with diagnosis. And they basically said, if the car exhibits these symptoms and it's logging this fault code, this is the fault. Do this, this, and this. We used to use them at Holden all the time and they're fantastic because anyone in the workshop could follow a TSB. They'll print it very clearly, step-by-step -step instructions, which means we could give it from everyone from the apprentice through to, um, you know, the, the busiest tech or the, the smartest tech in the shop because they could all follow instructions. Um, yes, even though they are Holden text, they can read. It was pretty good. So that's the great thing about TSBs and recalls. So the manufacturers found it for us. Um, the next one we see are smart cases. Now, smart cases are interesting. The way, the wording on smart cases basically think of it as common problems. Now, a common problem doesn't occur enough to make it a technical service bulletin or a service campaign or a service rework or a recall. Um, but a common problem is one that happens enough that happens to enough vehicles that we can um, get some data or get some um, information stored and, and put up somewhere that everyone can access. We can't call them common problems because common problems are bad. So we call them smart cases. And when you go into AutoLogic Guide and Data, you can look at the, the particular model. And if you go into an Audi or Volkswagen, there'll always be like 70 recalls and 70 smart cases and 150 TSBs. And you can choose from each one of those and find the one that suits your problem. Um, and possibly it'll help you diagnose the fault very, very quickly. Um, the other good thing is uh, this guide of data, if you've used it, it's pretty good. I'm sure you're happy. If you haven't used it, it gives us guided tests. Um, and we do this when I go out and do demos and tools or we do support and I can log into a tool. We can pull this up information up. Um, and it shows us how to actually test a component or how to test a circuit. And again, it's, it's in such a way that your first year apprentice can follow the information right through to your high level diagnostic tech. Um, wiring diagrams are on the guided data, really, really good source of wiring diagrams. Um, so far, I've found them to be very, very good. Um, unlike, I've used a lot of other aftermarket circuit diagrams and they're not as accurate, I think, as they could be. Um, these ones so far, I haven't found a fault with them. The, the wire colours are right, the pin terminals are right, um, and it identifies where the location are in the vehicle. So. Um, I was at a workshop the other week and we had a problem with the Subaru um, and the DTC was something around the fuel pump control module. Um, so we had a quick look at this uh, AutoLogic guided data and there was a TSB on these control modules. Um, I don't know if anyone's done it or not, but we had to do something with the control module. Uh, I had no idea where the control module was. Great thing was um, this actually showed me where the fuel pump control module was in the vehicle. It gave me a picture of what to look for, where it was and went straight to it. Um, so information like that can save us as diagnosticians lots and lots of time um, because we can go straight to the component and do the pinout testing that they require. Okay. Um, another way of uh, we can get technical resources is through uh, online workshop manuals. Um, BMW AOS, we can access uh, online workshop manuals from then uh, through our VAG vehicles, we can log on to Irwin. These are all subscription based, so we pay for these. And you can pay on an hourly basis or a daily or a yearly basis. Um, I generally buy it for uh, a couple of hours or for a day, and then I just charge it onto the customer. Um, and this is where you can get the information. The great thing is you can download this presentation afterwards. Um, uh, so Peugeot Citroen vehicles, um, service box, Ford technical service, um, Toyota is great with Toyota manuals. 
GM, AC, Delco, I use them a lot. They're very, very good. And through Hyundai Global Service Way. And these are all the ones that we can access in Australia quite easily. Uh, another technical resource you can use if you uh, subscribe to AutoLogic or you have a support contract is our live support, our IVS 360. And basically, um, IVS stands for Intelligent Vehicle, uh, Intelligent Vehicle Service, Intelligent Vehicle Systems. I should know that. I can't remember at this time or not. Um, but the 360 refers to 360 days a year. Um, and what it means is between the hours of, you know, 7.30 to 5.30, you can log a support case in on a vehicle and a master tech that works on those vehicles, that has been working on those vehicles for 20 years, will be in touch with you um, with information on your repair. And I use these guys quite a lot when I do demonstrations. Um, we did one on a Volkswagen Amarok uh, up the road here in Bombay the other day. And this Amarok, the, the poor guys were just road testing it. They did a service and low power, glow plug light flashing, all sorts of weird stuff. Um, and the fault codes were around the DPF being blocked. Uh, and I had a quick look and went, oh, no idea. Things haven't got 20,000 Ks on it. Shouldn't be a blocked DPF. Um, so I hit the support request, um, went straight down to Rich, our uh, VAG master tech. Rich got back to me with a phone call. I didn't even have a chance to get out of the car and go get a coffee while I was waiting. He uh, got back to us and said, it's a known fault from Volkswagen. There is a technical service bulletin on this car that will fix that. It's a software update. Happens on that model. And the, um, the technician that was working on it just wiped his head and went, oh, thank goodness it wasn't my fault. You know, he was so happy. He could then go to the customer and say, look, it's got to go back to the dealer have a software update, um, and hopefully they'll pay for that under warranty. Um, so it got these guys out of a lot of trouble because they could have burnt a lot of hours trying to find what they did wrong during that service. You know, did they put the wrong oil in that disrupted the DPF? Did they knock a hose off? Did they do something that would upset the hose? You can burn a lot of hours if you don't know. So by simply um, contacting IVS support, we knew straight away um, that there was a recall on this vehicle, uh, sorry, a, a technical service bulletin or a campaign on this vehicle. So it just saved time, and that didn't take long, which was really, really good. So we had an answer for the customer. That was a technical resource. Another technical resource that uh, a lot of you might have seen, um, this is on our tools, um, is the Diagnostic Network. Um, Diagnostic Network's run by a guy called Scott Brown out of America. He's a very, very smart technician. He has a workshop. He does a lot of um, high-level diagnostics. I met him once. Um, very clever guy. So he started the Diagnostic Network. Now, the Diagnostic Network, think of it as um, you're probably all familiar with TAT in Australia. TAT's like a, a local network of workshops that get together. You pay a fee. And basically, whenever you're in trouble, you can ring up. You can ask anyone in that network. You can post messages. Um, it's a great way to get information. It is a technical resource. Um, the reason we have Diagnostic Network on the tool is because Opus sponsor the Diagnostic Network through America. Um, so the subscription to DN comes with part of the tool. And you can jump on there um, and you can scroll through. You can type in a question um, or you can search for common problems or search for DTCs. And a lot of these guys will have seen the problem before and posted the fixes on it. So that's just another resource you can use. Um, you can also use Dr. Google. It is a, uh, you know, it, it is a form of technical um, information. I don't recommend it because for me to use something off Google, just, you know, how does this system work? I want to see it repeated in about three different places to know that it is a fact and not fiction. It's not just some blokes interpretation of a fault code. Um, some forums can be good for information, but just remember forums are generally run by uh, owners of cars. And I know if anyone's ever jumped on a Holden Commodore forum, you get some very intelligent people on Holden forums and they will tell you everything that's wrong with the car when that particular code comes up because that's what happened to their car. So be very, very careful which forums you get onto, only use reputable ones. Um, all right, moving on very quickly. Uh, once we've found uh, a little bit of information from our service manual, again, back to the EGR, we might need to test the EGR so we can see how it works. We can see what we're supposed to do to operate the EGR. So we do need to test it. Um, 
So we need to do some component testing. Now, good scan tool will drive a component, and the good scan tool will also give you feedback information while driving that component. Um, so the idea is, and you can see the image on the Drive Pro scan tool, um, these buttons down here allow us to drive. I can't even see what we're looking at here. Um, but we can drive the component. Let's say this is an EGR valve. Um, we're opening the valve, we're cloning the valve. Now this top graph would be the commanded value, what we're asking it to do. The bottom graph would be showing us what's actually happening. Now, theoretically, if we're asking the EGR to open so many percent and then close back to so many percent, we should see that actually happening from the feedback sensor. If our feedback looks like this and it doesn't repeat the one up there, well, we've obviously got an issue. So that's the great thing, specified versus actual. We can see what's going on. Or we can look at ECM commanded operation versus actual. We see that a lot with throttle position, um, actual throttle position versus commanded throttle position. And that can sort of tell us whether a... Um, an electric um, throttle actuator is not working properly. Um, use your graphing functions. Now, I know as a, um, as a mechanic, so I'm a mechanic and I'm an autolic, but I'm very, very visual whenever I diagnose. So I like to see things bouncing. I like colours. I like movement. And I recognise patterns. I'm, I'm really good with that. So when I look at a scan tool, I use the graphing function because numbers are fantastic and I can see differences in numbers, but... When I'm looking at grams per second on an airflow meter, I'm wondering if that's right for this vehicle. When I graph the uh, grams per second or kilograms per hour when I'm looking at an airflow meter and I graph it, I can actually see the air coming in changing as I change my throttle angle. I can see that better on a graph. Same with an oxygen sensor. I can see the switching of an oxygen sensor on a graph where I'm looking at numbers, I'm just seeing voltage change between you know, 0.1 and 0.8. Is it doing its right thing? Um, so graphing functions are very, very handy when we're testing and evaluating components. So the um, information we found in Tech Resources has told us to do this particular test. Um, I recommend graphing, very, very good way. Um, and the guided test might show us how to do it. Um, we might need, as part of our test and evaluations point, to put another tool in. Now, the reason I bring up the scope, it's not because Autologic sell them, it's because I really like them. They are a very good tool. Um, the reason I bring up the oscilloscope is because back here, what we're looking at is whatever this actuator is, or whatever this sensor is, the scan tool plugs into the OBD port. The OBD port is connected to a gateway module that uses some, for, some sort of communication with the engine module, with the ABS module. Um, and then that engine module is connected to the crank sensor or the EGR valve or the throttle actuator. Um, so what we're seeing, by the time the information gets back to the scan tool, most of the time it's pretty accurate, but what we're seeing is interpreted data. We're seeing that data, it's been modified. It's been changed from what's actually happening to a digital voltage to a serial communication voltage to a message. And then it's been um, interpreted by the scan tool once again from that serial data back to a voltage. What we don't know is if what we're seeing here is actually what's happening back at the sensor or actuator, which is why I like to use the scope, because the scope back probes right at the sensor, right at the actuator, and we can see exactly what's happening at that sensor or exactly what's happening at that actuator versus what the computer's telling us what's happening. Because if we have an issue in one of our communication networks, that information might not get through or the information might come through a little bit scrambled. So sometimes it's really good to test at the source. Right, the last part of the um, diagnostic process, perform the repair. Again, um, we, do, we might need to order parts, we might need to get customer approval, but basically, um, by performing the repair and confirming that that's fixed, that's our case closed. Um, now, I know whenever we do support cases, we always like to know that after we've given the support, we've asked you guys to go and do the testing um, or do a component, we'd love that feedback to go, did that work? You know, we might be 100% sure in our minds that it did work, but you know what? We always sleep better at night knowing. Um, I always like to know that any repair I do actually fixes the job so the customer isn't going to be ringing me up at 8 o'clock the next morning with a broken down vehicle. So um, 
we need to confirm it, do the repair, confirm it's fixed. And that's what I mean, run the vehicle through the conditions that set the DTC. And to do that, you might need service information, some OEM specs to do it. Um, initialising and adaption, some components require adapting after replacement, so the ECU can learn the component. Um, I know we uh, put a new battery in a vehicle. We've got to tell the control modules that we've put a new battery in. We need to tell the control modules where we've changed the size of the battery. We need to do that so the charging system charges the battery correctly. It's this vicious circle with cars these days. Um, I know that when I replace a battery or I lose power or I put a new window reg in a Holden, I have to teach the, the um, body control module the end stops, the pinch points. For sunroofs, for windows, a lot of cars are the same. That's initialising or adapting. Um, if we put a new mechatronics unit in a DSG, we need to perform adaptions to teach the uh, the mechatronics unit or the computer where how the plates are worn, how worn they are, um, where the shift points are. Um, some components require coding only. Some components require coding and programming. Coding is basically telling the component it's now part of a network. Um, the component knows what it is, so on a VAG vehicle, it's an ABS control unit. It knows it's an ABS control unit, it's programmed to it, but coding it is telling it it's now part of this particular vehicle and associated with this VIN. Coding and programming is where we get uh, a blank control unit. So the computer comes blank, um, we plug it in, it doesn't know whether it's a pineapple or a doorstop, it really doesn't know until you tell it. So the programming puts the programming in and says, yes, you're actually a engine control unit. Um, the coding then tells you you're an engine control unit in this vehicle and you've got to talk to all these other ones. So that's what happens with a lot of vehicles and that's what we need to do. Um, when you need to uh, do these adaptions or codings, um, look in your service functions on your scan tools, um, look under control unit functions uh, for VAG vehicles, um, look under CIP for BMW that's where uh, coding individualization and programming is. That's a BMW only. Um, module programming is in Ford and GM vehicles. That's where you're going to find this information. All right, um, very quickly. All right, so I've gone a little bit over our hour, as I generally always do. That's the first part of our diagnostics course. So there are seven steps. They're the ones we use. Next week, we are going to look at, I think, uh, five different scenarios, diagnostic scenarios, actual cases that have come across our bench, and how we used those seven steps to diagnose each of those cases. And they're all different faults, um, faults from engine management to air conditioning to, uh, uh, I think one's a, a coolant loss on a particular vehicle or a misfire or something. Um, and they're all different, but the seven steps, um, collecting the facts, fault finding, verifying. It's worked in every one of those cases and it's found the problem very, very quickly. So we're gonna go through those next week. Um, is there anything else I need to quickly talk about? Probably not, but if you've got any questions on information we've gone over tonight, I know it's now quarter past eight, everyone's looking at having a cold beer or going to bed. Um, ask me your questions, I'll be here a little while. I'll stay on for another uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, I can confirm that these seven steps work very well because I had to use it last night. My car broke down. Now, my car broke down in, on Ballina Road in the middle of the road as I was making a right turn. It just stopped. Um, so it was very embarrassing for anyone that was driving past last night when a black Audi was broken down in the middle. Now, I diagnosed that car on the side of the road um, pretty quickly using those facts. What were the symptoms? Is it a fault? Yes, it's a fault. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Jess. Uh, no worries, Pat. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I'll send you, I will send you the link for next week. I've just got to make sure that um, they've put it up on the website. Now, all these webinars are on the AutoLogic website. If you go to AutoLogic and then go to... Um, uh, webinars um, and you can click the link from there but I'll post the link I'll email the link out to you guys uh, can I send the link for next week as well Jake uh, I don't think it's been generated yet but what I will do I've got your email address as soon as they generate it I'll email that one out to everyone that depends on tonight um, yes yeah, so my poor Audi broke down 
So I had to ring for a tow truck because when it stopped, it stopped. Um, so I've diagnosed this thing on the side of the road pretty damn quickly. Um, anyway, I had to ring NRMA. NRMA wanted to send a, uh, yeah, Nari Stewart. Yeah, that'll be good next week. Um, when I had to get a tow truck, they wanted to send a technician out to diagnose the vehicle for me. And I'm going, please don't. It'll be a waste of your time because, you know, this is what's going on. Now, unfortunately, these guys thought I was just some person off the street uh, without a clue. So anyway, when the, uh, the NRMA guy showed up on the side of the road, he took one look at the car and he went, two words, tow truck. It's an Audi. I'm not going to touch it. And that goes back to that first diagnostics. He evaluated it straight away and went, I don't have the tools, I don't have the knowledge, let's just put on a tow truck. Um, so unfortunately, I was at 11.30 last night waiting for him to pick up my car. Um, but the good news is it'll be fixed tomorrow. It's got a dodgy injector. Yay, nice and expensive. Um, okay, so we've we got any more questions relating to our diagnostics other than uh, we'll see you all next week. I'll just hang in for a little bit longer. Let's get this over here. See you next week. Yeah, no worries, Jess. Uh, getting to grips with diagnostics. Ah, here's the link. Clint Flower has discussed everything diagnostic relation to case studies covering a variety of brands BMW X5, Audi A4, VF Commodore, Toyota Prado. Excellent. So the link looks like it's going to go live very soon. Pat, yep, no worries, mate. Absolutely. You will see me. I don't get to see you guys, though, because you don't have your cameras on. Yeah, no worries, Tony. Hope you got a little bit out of it tonight. Now they're out. Yep, okay, I'll just reply to that. EXC. Excellent. Oh, excellent. Please go. Hey. So the link will go out tomorrow, um, and I'll email it to everyone. Um, when you got there, thanks. You remind me of some of my old diagnostic techniques. I use 30, 40 years. Yeah, and they don't change, do they, Jake? Um, you know, my my boss, I did my apprenticeship under. He taught me most of those techniques, and they are still good today. It doesn't matter that the cars have changed in 30, 40 years. The technique's exactly the same. It's just that we tend to lose sight or we lose track of that diagnostic path. Yep, no worries, Jason, we'll see you. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, I will do that. Um, I've got your email. Um, I don't know where you're located, but I I'll, I'll, might contact you. If I send you an email with some contact details, um, I might be able to just give you a ring. Yeah, Temple of the Questions to give the customer. Uh, I think I do, Chris. Gold Coast. Excellent. You're just up the road from me. I'm just down the road in um, Lismore, Wollongbar. So as soon as those borders open, I can come and visit you. Otherwise, I might be able to um, flick a tool up you as a demo. Uh, Jake, yep, yeah, excellent. No worries, Jake. Good luck, mate, and I'll talk to you next week. Um, yeah, Chris, I'll see if I can find that template. I know I've got one. Um, I do have it on a PDF, actually. I might uh, email it to you or, or print out a few copies and drop down so you can make some as well. 
Stuart, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, if you want your students to jump on, uh, yeah, absolutely, they can do it. Tonight's video, it's recorded live, um, and that'll be posted up as well, so it can be watched at any time. But, yeah, look, definitely, uh, yeah, good luck getting this, Steve. Yeah, I know, borders are closed. Uh, I do know a back way. No, no, as soon as it opens, we'll be up there. Uh, yeah, so definitely, Stuart, share it with um, all your students down there. That's not a problem at all. Um, actually, Stuart, you might even know um, who else you got down there in TAFE. Uh, you probably know Tony um, Salafia. You probably know um, Wayne Jenkins from TAFE down there. Uh, you probably know Paul Richards as well. Paul's up here at uh, Coffs Harbour at the moment. And Wayne and Tony are still down there, and they're all ex tafe guys, again, very smart. All right, guys. So I reckon that's going to call it 12, uh, 8.30. I'm going to turn this off now. So all the best. Any more questions, um, you can certainly drop me an email uh, or give me a phone call. Uh, work phone number 0476-000277. So there's my work, my Opus phone number. And here is my email address if there's anything you need more or need to know. All right, on that note, guys, I'll switch this off. I'll talk to you all again next week. Um, again, if you've got any questions, think about it between now and then, and we'll do our best to answer it.